Okay, hello everybody. My name is Kim Snyder. It's 7 o'clock by my watch, so we're going to go ahead and get started. I want to welcome everybody. I know we've got people still making their way on, but uh, in out of respect for everybody's time, we're going to go ahead and get started on time, as we always do. Very excited about tonight's webinar. So uh, I'm going to do a little bit of housekeeping with you while just to give people uh, an opportunity to uh, maybe make their way on. While I, Before I do that, though, just to make sure, I want to make sure, number one, that you can hear me, and number two, that you can see the title slide um, of our presentation. So if you would just type over on the right-hand side in your GoToWebinar control panel, just let me know that you can see and that you can hear me. Uh, I would appreciate that. Marissa, thank you. Everyone else, can you see me? Can you hear, hear me? Just let us know. Great. Excellent. Stephanie, thank you. All right. Very good. Just want to check. Hate to get about, you know, 30 minutes into this thing and everybody be wondering what it is that we're talking about, right? So, um, terrific. Let's get uh, going with some housekeeping. And if I can get on the right, uh, hang on here one second. I got it get on PowerPoint so it'll let me advance this slide. There we go. Excellent. Housekeeping. Um, tell you a couple of things. Number one, uh, you've already figured out probably how to ask questions. Over on the right-hand side in the GoToWebinar control panel, you just type your questions in. I'm going to be monitoring those questions as we go along, um, and I will sort of moderate, and if it makes sense to ask the question right then and there, because it's it's something that Shelly's talking about and it makes more sense there, then I'll ask it. Otherwise, I will hold them to the end. We are going to have a Q&A session at the end, probably something like 30 minutes. This is a 90-minute webinar, so we will go from 7 o'clock East Coast time till approximately 8.30 uh, with about 30 minutes, hopefully, for Q&A. Um, and uh, so we'll try to get all of your questions in then. So that's how you ask them. The other thing you should know is I take the questions first come, first serve. In other words, the first ones uh, that pop up are the first ones that are going to get asked. So if you want to make sure that you get your question answered, then go ahead and type it in now. Don't wait until we get to the Q&A section to type your question in. Um, the other thing that you should know is that we are recording this session Barring any sort of technical glitches, we will have the recording available to you within a few days. We always put those up on the Polo Skills website. If you haven't been to Polo Skills, I would encourage you to do that. It's poloskills.com. We have over 260 videos available there for your um, instruction and, and viewing pleasure. So including all of the archives of all of our past web webinars. So um, hope you'll go take advantage of that. Third thing is, um, what was the third thing? Questions, archive. Oh, third thing is, as you leave the webinar, you're going to be asked uh, for to take a little quick little survey. I know it's tempting to blow that survey off, but I would ask you, if you would, please fill that out. That is very, very helpful, both in terms of telling me what you thought of this and whether I should do more like this or not, but also to let the USPA who's underwriting this webinar know that it is important and valuable to you. And I would add to that, uh, if you do find it helpful, to make sure that you let your USPA governor know that as well. So that's it on the housekeeping. With that, I'd like to introduce your presenter. Your presenter this evening is Dr. Shelley Onderdunk. And uh, Shelly, I asked Shelly to do this presentation because I had the privilege of seeing her do a similar presentation to Team USPA about a year ago. And I was, I learned so much from that presentation. I can't tell you. I'm always constantly shelling, uh, Shelly bringing in, you know, the three day rule or something that I learned in that, in that presentation. And I just, figured that uh, since I got so much out of it that all of our Polo Skills viewers and listeners would get um, equally as much. So to tell you a little bit about Shelly, um, Shelly went to undergrad at Yale. She did her veterinary studies at University of Georgia, um, of which I'm more acquainted nowadays than I, than I want to be. Have way too many horses going to University of Georgia, but an excellent uh, vet school. 
Her husband, for those of you who don't know, is uh, the former 10 goal professional Adam Snow, and she and Adam um, care for a, um, a very large number of um, horses in their breeding and, and um, polo operation. So, um, and, and is it fair to say that your emphasis is holistic? Yes, it would be fair to say that. Okay, holistic. I, I never know what the right word is to call that, but holistic yeah. approach to the care of polo ponies, right? Yes. Very good. Yes, that would be fair to say. All right, so we're thrilled to have Dr. Shelley on her donk. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to you, Shelley. Okay, thank you very much. Welcome, everybody. Our first slide, as you can see, is on nutrition, and that's not an accident. I believe that nutrition is the most important part of preparing a polo pony or any athlete um, to get to the field or to the show ring. It is something that is very important to understand that it's a long-term commitment. You don't start feeding a horse and see the results uh, immediately in a day or even, even in a week. So the feed that you're giving your horse right now, you're going to reap the benefits of that this summer when you're playing polo on it, for example. So it's very important to have um, a long-term plan with nutrition and to maintain your horses uh, in the off season as well as during the season. Um, so the next slide here, forage first. So uh, nutrition's first and then forage is first. For the vast majority of horses that are in a moderate amount of work, they do not need a lot of grain. Um, if you give them good pasture or good hay, good quality hay, um, that is often all they will need. Having said that, it is very useful to give them a vitamin and mineral supplement if you are only feeding them forage. Uh, we are in uh, Aiken, South Carolina, and we have a company called Banks Mill, which um, makes feed, makes fresh feed, which is very good. And they also sell a supplement, which is designed just for horses that are eating forage only. So something like that in whatever area you live in would be probably good advice. And obviously they need access to salt as well. Um, there's a lot of different kinds of opinions on which salt is best. And probably it varies according to the area that you live in. So you may wanna refer that question to your veterinarian as to which kind of like plain salt or mineral salt would be most appropriate for your uh, geographical area. Next slide. Here we go. Okay. I was pressing down rather than over. <laughs> All right. So pasture, here we go. The benefits of horses eating pasture are too great really to quantify. Their head is down. When a horse eats with their head down, it allows their upper respiratory tract to drain. So if you think about it, it's just a basic physical fact. Horses are meant to eat on the ground. And the more hours they do that, the less likely they are to have upper respiratory tract diseases, just uh, as a purely you know, physical uh, phenomenon. It also decreases stress on the horses because it is their natural behavior. Uh, it is also good, as in this picture, to uh, have horses turned out together if they get along, um, because the, again, that is a very natural behavior. In polo, we are extremely fortunate that most people um, recognize this need of horses to be social with the other horses, and they have the benefits of exercising in groups and generally living with their uh, friends, so to speak, uh, and traveling with their friends and doing everything in groups, which actually is a huge benefit to the horse and getting turned out with their friends is just yet another boon for them. It can decrease behaviors like weaving or cribbing. Um, I know that many polo players do get their horses off the track and when horses are young and kept in stalls like they are when they're in training for the track, they often will develop these um, stall vices um, but often those can be significantly reduced by giving them turnout time. And then, of course, the nutritional benefits of fresh grass um, are, are great because you get vitamins and minerals, again, that are, you can think about it as a long-term process where the grass that your horse is eating in the summer may 
continue to nourish them in in ways as their um, as months kind of go on. The other obvious thing about grass as opposed to hay is that grass has its moisture content in it. You're much less likely to have colic problems or other digestive issues when horses are on pasture. We already talked a little bit about the social benefits of pasture. Um, the herd dynamics you have to be careful of though. You have to make sure that you're making wise decisions about how to turn horses out. Um, generally in the wild, unlike this picture, which is a beautiful picture, mostly if there's a stallion, they'll keep a band of horses that is relatively small, about 10 horses, generally max, maybe with some babies thrown in there, might get a little bit bigger, but that is more or less the natural number for horses to hang out in. And so I myself have tried to replicate that on my farm where I don't have like one huge pasture of 40 acres where I turn, you know, 20 horses out, but rather have smaller areas where you get more like eight horses or so. And then if those horses are living together, they'll establish a pecking order and they won't tend to injure each other quite so much, which is obviously very important for us. We don't want our horses injuring themselves when they're turning out, getting turned out. So this is a next slide is about the benefits of fat in the, in the uh, feed that is, not the benefits of fat on the body. So benefits of fat um, are that one, the spoof test, very, very interesting study done several years ago where they fed horses the same diet, except one had a higher fat content than the others. The total calories, however, were the same. So it was just the content of the feed that was different. And then they would lead the horses out of the barn and put an umbrella up suddenly as the horse was going out of the barn and they measured how much the horses spooked. The horses that were on fat were significantly less likely to spook than the horses that were on a regular diet. So that's one benefit of fat. It does, it's supposed to burn quieter. In other words, the horses just are a little bit less excitable when they're getting the same amount of calories from a high fat diet versus a high carbohydrate diet. Um, the other benefit of fat is that it burns a little bit less hot. So, and when I say that, I'm just putting that in layman's terms. In other words, when the environmental temperature is very high, which is the case for many polo players, we all tend to follow the sun and play our horses in warm weather, whether it be in Texas or Southern California or Florida, um, or the summertime anywhere can be hot. And when you have those horses on a higher fat, they don't create so much body heat when they burn their feed. We all know that in the winter time, it's very important to give our horses a lot of forage because they create heat by digesting the hay that we give them. And that's how they stay warm. Um, so it makes sense the opposite way when we want them to stay cool. We don't want them to get overheated when they're playing chuckers. Having a high fat diet is very helpful. And then just here's a information on Banks Mill for those of you in Aiken. They make fresh feed. Um, and it's very important, whichever feed you use, to, to talk to your distributor or your local mill, wherever you're getting your feed from, to find out how fresh the feed is and to find out what kind of uh, vitamins and minerals, who they're using to get a balanced diet, because um, most private feed companies will, will uh, use some kind of a research institution to balance their feed, and what kinds of, you know, for lack of a better word, bells and whistles they have in the feed. Probiotics um, have gotten a lot of attention in the last few years. They're very important for horses. We'll talk a little bit more about them later, um, but it's very useful to have in the horse's feed. To address a few questions that came in before the webinar began about nutrition, um, one question that I, I particularly liked was, how do you know the feed your horse is getting is sufficient nutrition to keep them in top health as an equine athlete? athlete. So this is really the crux of the issue. You need to get to know your horse. And when I say that your horse, I mean that in the singular, because every single horse is different. If you have four horses or you have 40 horses, it doesn't matter. They're all going to be a little bit different in their nutritional needs. 
and especially in their nutritional needs to get to the polo field and play their best. So some of the things that you need to observe in your own horses are their energy level, their body condition score, their skin, and of course, how they're performing. So their energy level and how they're performing are a little bit linked. Sometimes, of course, a horse has too much energy and then you need to cut back on the feet. Sometimes it won't have enough energy. You might need to boost up the caloric intake a little bit. I, as I mentioned earlier, the best way I like to boost the caloric intake is to increase fat. The way that I like to decrease the caloric intake would be to reduce the level of carbohydrates or grain that's being fed. The body condition score is a way that veterinarians, but any lay person can learn it very easily, scores the amount of weight that the horse is carrying. And what you need to learn how to do is to assess the horse, not how much really the hay belly is, because <laughs> sometimes that can be a little misleading, but looking at the actual bone structure and how much of the bones you can see underneath the skin. So an ideal weight for a polo pony, we call it body condition score, probably four or five or six. Four being, the, the scale is from one to nine, nine being obese and one being very, very thin. And so the middle range is the best for athletes. And But different horses are going to compete their best at a different BCS score. So you might have F six, your six horses, two of them might, be best at body condition score four, two might be at five and two might be at six. It depends on the horse. And this is where you need to get to know your own horse and how to best get it to the field. The skin, of course, is always a great indicator of a horse's health. It should be glossy, love to see dapples and all that type of thing. So those are things to watch with um, nutrition. One other question was how would be the day-to-day -day nutrition for a high goal horse? I think that I have gone over most of that, but I just would like to stress again that it's going to be different for every horse. There's no recipe that you can just say, oh, this is what you feed your horse. Because when you get down to it, the, the forage is first. Pick a very good grain if you need to add it so that you need more energy levels. If you need even more energy level, add the fat. Make sure that the ration that you're giving is a balanced feed, add salt, add any mineral supplements. And from then on, it's going to be getting to know your horse. And along with your veterinarian, you can fine tune your own recipe for that. We will go on now. Be before, oh, we okay. do, yeah, yeah. before we do, I just have a, a couple questions. So um, first of all, I'll, I'll just let everybody know that we have uh, I think three videos on polo skills from Charlie Herrick, who's the owner of Great. Banks Mill Feeds. That that was really eye-opening for me. I never really thought about feed in the way that he presented it on those videos in terms of managing your horse's energy level up or down. Just as Shelley was saying, with fats and carbohydrates. And so, if you if this is something that interests you, I'd really encourage you to go on polo skills and uh, and watch those videos. But I've, I've got a couple questions for you, um, Shelley, as you were talking that, that uh, just occurred to me. Um, one of the things that Owen says a lot is, Owen Reinhardt, for those of you um, who don't know, Shelley's neighbor, is that, um, you know, the thing he sees most is that horses are overfed, particularly in sponsor horses, overfed and underbitted. Forget the underbitted for a minute. What about the overfed? Do you, do you, is that, do you agree with that? I think that overfed can mean a lot of things. It I, it depends whether he means that it is that their body condition score is that they're a little obese or overweight versus overfed, meaning that they're being fed uh, a wrong uh, balance. And like so they're hot. Too much grain. Too and much grain. Too hot. Yeah. Yes. So those are two different problems. And I really think it's important to distinguish the difference between the two and, and not knowing which one Owen was talking about. I'm going to assume that he was probably talking about the horses being a little bit too hot. And that's where the uh, 
really, you really need to become a connoisseur of the nutrition to get horses to the field, to play high goal polo and have the energy to run, but yet not be too hot to play. Mm -hmm. And that's where the high fat comes in, mm -hmm. in my opinion. Yeah. It's like a science experiment to get it right. Kind of, isn't it? It is. And it's definitely experimental because it's going to be different with every horse. You've got to find the right balance for each horse and you have these guidelines and then you tinker with it. Mm -hmm. So here's the challenge I think for many of us, particularly lower level players. So we generally don't take care of our own horses because we have nine to five jobs. Someone mm -hmm. else, they're in a big barn or with a groom and those grooms are typically, or, or barns are just going through and kind of feeding the same feed to every horse. And yes. well, how do you, how do you address that when you're in that position? Well, I, it's one of my, uh, least favorite things about polo. There's lots of things about polo. I love like the socialization aspect for the horses and stuff, but in my work, when I work with a three day eventer or a show jumper or a dressage horse, though, those people might own one to three horses and they're individualizing everything about that horse to maximize that horse's potential. And I just don't see any reason in polo why we can't do the same thing. Hmm. And if you need to hire, and it, it comes down to uh, two things. It, well, it comes down to efficiency as far as getting the most out of your horse, but it also comes down to cost because think about the extra feed cost, for example, if you're overfeeding your horse, that's expensive, mm -hmm. right? And the other thing is that, um, you know, to get the most out of your horse and longevity, um, it, it's twofold. It's an issue of horse welfare, taking care of that horse for the duration of its possible career, which hopefully is 10 years or longer. In my mind, every horse should be able to have that long of a career. Um, or, and, and secondly, um, financially, it also makes sense to have longevity in your horses. And so spending a little bit more money up front, you're going to, you're going to get paid back in the end by maybe you need to hire a second person to come and help once a day for an hour at feeding time so that the horses get more individual care. Mm. That would be my answer. Okay. Interesting. All right. <laughs> let's go on to uh, feet. Okay. So farriery. Um, the soundness begins at the ground. Did I, I might've just skipped yeah, ahead. That's All okay. right. There yeah, we go. No, that's okay. Yeah. Go, go right ahead. All right. Yeah. Soundness begins at the ground. So the function of the foot I should say of the unshod foot is the absorption of concussive forces. So really we have to understand that what the foot is trying to do is it hits the ground is to decrease the shock that is hitting on the bones as it goes up the leg. And as the leg meets the skeleton, the, the axial skeleton, which is like the body that we, we call about it. So it's a very, very important function. Uh, anybody who, has experience with polo knows that often when you have an unsound horse, it will be something that is in the foot. So many foot problems can be corrected by really good corrective trimming and good farriery work. So there's a couple of things that you can do to try to minimize having problems. One is regular trimming. Stay on a schedule year round, even though the horse's feet are growing not quite so fat in the, fast in the winter often, it's still important to keep them on a schedule. It's important to talk to your farrier about the proper way that the horses should be trimmed and don't kind of, oh, it's raining. Yeah, <laughs> it is. And don't skimp on a farrier. That's my next advice. Farriers will love me, but, uh, it does cost money. It's something that's well worth it. And again, it's sort of a long-term versus a short-term benefit. Uh, just kind of with, like with the nutrition, you put your money in, in the beginning and you'll, you'll get the rewards. You reap the benefits of it. So the exercise track and the living conditions, it's very hard to keep a horse sound that's living in a swamp, for example. Um, you know, the way they're walking in and out of the water all the time, your farrier will complain to you about the shoes falling off. Um, and so wetness can be a big problem. Um, so that's something to consider. And the other thing is the exercise track. Very, very important to have a good surface. 
We're lucky in polo that the horses are asked to work on a very forgiving surface usually, which is turf. And the more you can ride them on turf, the better. Everybody doesn't have that luxury sometimes though, but do be careful of working horses on very hard surfaces. And uh, if you do have a large polo farm, or if you're in an area that has a group of horses that are regularly on a track for exercise purposes, it is very well worth your while to make sure that surface is, is good. There are a couple of questions about feet. One was about abscess care and prevention from Jay Holt. Thank you for that question, Jay, if you're listening. And that is a bugaboo for a lot of people. The best thing I can tell you is that preventative care, again, is very important. Keeping uh, on a regular trimming schedule, letting the horses go barefoot some of the year when they're turned out is particularly beneficial because it will harden the horse's feet and make them much more resilient. And then when you do have an abscess, um, you probably... You may, you may want to call your veterinarian and get, get their advice, but the regular routine for abscess care is soaking to allow the abscess to open up. You can call your farrier sometimes. Sometimes they will help you um, pair out the hoof to facilitate that and, and then keep it clean. And usually once the abscess has broken, the horse is immediately more comfortable. Um, you may need to see your veterinarian to get some phenylbutazone um, to make the horse more comfortable if it's a very bad abscess and the horse can be very acutely lame for several days, if that's the case. Are there any questions? Oh, but there's one more I think I have here. Oh, yes, from Buckshot. He was asking about removable cocks with lower hock arthritis. So... Lots of polo ponies do use um, some kind of elevated heels on their hind shoes, and farriers will put them on. Sometimes they're permanent, sometimes they're removable. Just remember that anytime you change the angles, especially suddenly, of the horse's foot and the way it hits the ground, you're going to have some changes in the way that absorption of shock travels up the leg. Again, for the most part in polo, because the surface that they're working on is very soft as being turf, I don't see as much lower hawk, lower hawk arthritis in polo ponies as you do, for example, in jumpers or in dressage horses, which are working generally on less forgiving surfaces how the cocks I'm actually amazed sometimes when I see the cocks on these hind legs of the horses and amazed that they don't have any problems. And I'd say that's the case more often than not mm -hmm. in my experience. Um, and I think it is because of the surface that they work on. If they were working on a hard dirt surface or they had to, you know, be a carriage horse and be on the pavement or something, I think we'd see a, a much higher incidence. Not to say that it doesn't exist, but if you need those cocks for safety um, of the horse and the rider for playing, I would advise putting them in. Mm -hmm. Okay. Are there any other questions about the farriery section now? Um, well, no, um, not really. We'll get to the rest of them, I think, in the q and I, okay. I just had a couple of general questions, though. Um, so thinking about feet and then limb problems. So just like you were talking about the hocks went with mm -hmm. the, um, cocks. So I'm not sure if you can quantify this, but what percentage of the lower of what we consider lower limb problems. So, you know, ankles, hocks, what stifles, whatever really are coming from the feet. Well, that is hard to exactly quantify, but I would say that, you know, a good third to a half of lameness that is seen can be blocked out to the foot. 
Yeah, because when, when shrimp, when I brought you shrimp and, right, shrimp was having problems and you said, well, look at her feet and look how, you know, look how crooked this is, right? And I was like, oh, my gosh, I didn't even think about that. But yeah. sure, if that angle is off, then that over time is going to put stress on that joint. And so right. we should really be paying a lot of attention to that, even when we think it's something higher up the leg, right? Yes. And it's always a question of, you know, primary and secondary, but it's, there's, there are often more than one, there's often more than one thing involved in any lameness issue. Mm. So, but I just do stress to people, especially when you're buying a horse, start at the bottom, look at the feet first. Right, right. That's a really good point, right? And I guess feed shows up in feet too, doesn't it? It does. You can tell a horse's nutrition from their feet and all, all sorts of things and, and, a, and a general measure of how the horse has been cared for as well um, shows up in their feet because if you're buying a horse who has beautiful feet and they're shod really well or maybe they're barefoot but you can tell that they've been trimmed very well, you know that that owner probably has been taking very good care of that horse in other aspects as well. Oh, uh, yeah, good point. Um, I'm get, just getting a, a text. Um, apparently there's one or two people who are having a hard time hearing us. And I just wanted to, I did not say this at the beginning. Um, if you are having a hard time, it's generally a network traffic issue. Nobody, you know, most everyone else can hear us. Okay. And the way you generally solve that is either just log off and log right back in. And most of the time that will clear it up. Or if it doesn't work, you do have the option of dialing in and listening over the telephone. Um, and that phone number, if you just click the button on audio and say use telephone, that phone number will pop up. And of course, that always solves it because there is no network uh, traffic problem there. So if a couple of you are having um, problems hearing, I do apologize, but that would be the way to, to solve that. I, I noticed that we're getting a lot of really good questions too, so I can't wait to get to the, to the Q&A section. Okay, so we'll move on to our next general topic, which is soundness. And I'm a little bit biased on this topic as I practice mostly holistic veterinary medicine, as Kim mentioned at the beginning. I'm a certified acupuncturist, and I practice also Twina, which is a Chinese form of chiropractic. And I believe that's essential for keeping the hardworking equine athlete um, going at their best for the long haul. Um, again, it's, you're going to hear me say this many times, but it's a more of a long-term outlook on horses to try to prevent problems before they actually happen. And as, as well as the fact that you can prevent a lot of lower limb issues by taking care of the spine and taking care of the muscles, um, of the back and the gluteals and other of these, these and the neck and these powerful muscles that really are the locomotion of our animals as we're asking them to run and turn. So having said that, the muscles of a horse are incredibly big and strong. Uh, they need to be to do what we're asking them to do. It's very important to condition these muscles properly. We're going to be talking about actual conditioning in the next section. But just to bring it up here, there's always going to be a balance when you are using the horse as an athlete between building up the muscles and then breaking them down. And we obviously don't want to break the horse's muscles down. Um, you're going to, some of that's going to be inevitable at times. If you have to play the horse into the seventh minute and 30th second, or you have to come back on a horse and double it in the finals, or, you know, so, some of it is inevitable, but I would try to always minimize, um, that idea of, of breaking the muscles down and, and destroying the muscle fibers by excess work. The best way to build up muscles is through long and slow work, which we will go into in more detail later. Um, but many injuries in all aspects of uh, equine sports in my opinion, occur from horses that are not sufficiently muscled to do what they're asked to do. So we look at a, a horse and you see the development of their muscles. You see how their back is developed, their neck, their gluteal muscles, their hind end, their shoulder muscles. And you can get a pretty good picture right away. Well, this horse is prepared to do X, Y, or Z. And so 
that's just something to keep in mind that we don't want our horses skinny at the expense of not having any muscle mass. They need to be fit, but that's a different thing. Hmm. So the bones, I put up remodeling because many people really aren't aware that bones are a living tissue. They act slowly over time, but they are very similar to muscle in that they can regenerate. We know that because when we break a bone, it can heal. Well, the same thing happens on a daily basis um, within the bone itself, where when it gets used, it lays down more bone. So incredibly important for the bones, especially in a young horse, but in any age horse to maintain the, the mass of the bone, sort of similar to the muscles. You're thinking about just maintaining that strength in the bone by consistent and good work. Um, you can prevent a lot of catastrophic breakdown injuries by having a good bone mass and having the horse prepared to do what they're, they're being asked to do by having been conditioned properly. So there's a lot of questions about soundness that came in that I'm going to address a few of them. I think that the, what do you think is the, okay, this is the question. What do you think is the most important and most often forgotten soundness care issue by Nancy Louie? Thank you, Nancy. That's a very good question. And in my opinion, of course, I'm a, a perhaps biased because of the line of work that I specialize in, but I think that probably the most commonly overlooked soundness care issue is muscle soreness. Uh, polo ponies are often very sore after a game. And if they're just chucked into a stall and let, and they have to sit there for 12 hours, they're going to get stiff. And anybody who is a human athlete knows that that's not a very comfortable situation to be in. So I think that, uh, it's important to address that. It's important to address that by cooling horses out properly after chuckers. Uh, it's important to allow horses some free uh, range, ideally the night after they play. Like if they can be turned out, that's ideal because then they'll get to walk a little bit around and not get so stiff. Um, if it needs to be addressed from a veterinary perspective with medication, that would be appropriate. Um, Any way to make that horse more comfortable. This might be a, a good um, place to address um, this question uh, mm -hmm. about um, from Jan or Jan, may, I'm not sure which, um, is all the wrapping and spraying with beagle oil really necessary? And if so, in what circumstances, age, injury, injury prevention? Because a lot of that does happen post game, right? For yes. me, it's at the trailer, yes. in fact, at the ice at the trailer. And um, so what are your thoughts on that? My thought, well, we were, we will get into that later. Okay. Um, you want to hold under it the for later? Care. But no, let, let's, but let's go ahead and address one of those things at least. And, and I, I am a big believer in preventative care, like first aid sort of treatment, so to speak. So wrapping can be very useful. I think that liniments are great. Alcohol does just as a good job often. And, um, the, Icing is the gold standard. So every barn should have an ice maker. <laughs> and um, any horse that has a history of injury ought to be iced after every chucker. Like if they have an old tendon or an old suspensory injury, that leg should always be iced, probably the, the opposite leg as well. Uh, and ideally in horses that are working very hard, just make it a habit of getting every horse iced once a week and you'll prevent a lot of injuries from happening. Ice is very cost effective. It is incredibly effective and at reducing inflammation, which is our goal. And it's relatively easy to do if you just invest in some ice boots. Mm -hmm. So um, in terms of liniment then and, and those sorts of things, those do help with soreness or, or no? I, I believe that some liniments are very good. I think that alcohol is a good liniment as well in the lower leg, particularly. Um, I think that uh, Epsom salts can be good. We were talking about that early with abs, um, abscesses. 
I think that old fashioned grooming where you actually rubbed your horses is actually very effective as well. Although it does take a lot of time to give a horse a massage. So I understand that that is something beyond what most people are able to do. Okay. All right. There's another question from Ahmed, which is what uh, you should look for in buying a horse. And I, I'm not really getting into that as far as buying horses, but I did want to bring it up with the soundness um, section just because confirmation is important. So when you're looking at a horse, um, do pay attention to the feet like we talked about earlier. Pay attention to the legs. Um, you can get yourself some basic confirmation manuals or, or little books or brochures to um, understand yourself about how legs should be put together and how they, you know, when we say it's a straight leg or it's over at the knee or wh whatever it may be. And there, there's certainly a wide variety of confirmations that um, do perfectly fine on the polo field, but you do want to avoid some certain things. So, so just real quick while we're on the topic, um, vet checks, pre-purchase exams. I highly recommend them. Um, but I would recommend using a veterinarian who is familiar with the sport of polo if you're buying a polo pony. Because? Because the, the, the needs are different for each athletic endeavor. Um, uh, there, there's at least you, you should have a veterinarian who's very familiar with the, the equine athlete. Um, and ideally polo because they're going to understand what the horse is being asked to do. And that determines what kind of horse best suits. Mm -hmm. And so if you want to get a good opinion, now that's different. If you're just, if you say, Oh, I just want them to check the heart and the eyes and call it a day that that's fine too. If you know exactly what you're looking for. But if you don't know exactly what you're looking for and you're not real experienced at purchasing polo ponies, I would recommend you really get somebody who knows what they're doing when they're doing your vet check. And, and again, um, I would say we have a three part series in polo skills by Paul, Paul Wallerman on the best. Uh, yeah. About, um, pre-purchase exams and, uh, man, he goes into an amazing amount of detail. We even went with him on a pre-purchase exam. And um, so that's really good if you're looking to buy a horse and you want to know um, how much or how little you could get done on a pre-purchase exam. So. Okay, so conditioning. This is probably the most important area which is going to determine the longevity of your horse. So... Oh, oops. Sorry. sorry. We both pressed it. <laughs> We're going crazy here. Hang on. Let's go back. Here we yeah. go. So one more, right? No, this is it. Yeah. Okay. Systematic. So important. <laughs> oh, it's a delay. That's why. <laughs> okay. There we go. There we go. So important to have a long-term plan and stick to it. I, I, and I say stick to it. I, obviously if a horse gets injured or there's some, can sometimes be extraneous circumstances you can't prevent, you're going to have to be adaptable. But for the most part, know when your season starts and work backwards. So you're going to have a period of time that you know the horses are going to start work. And then you know that on this day, you know, they're going to walk for so long. Then they're going to start trotting. Then after they've been trotting for 15 or 20 minutes, then you're going to start singling them. And then after you've ridden them three or four times single, then you're going to start playing slow chuckers on them. And you're going to make sure you give them – at least five slow chuckers before you start pressuring them. That's just a basic framework. I prefer to walk the horses for at least 10 days, even up to two weeks. And this is, I'm talking about a sound horse before they go into heavier work. If they've been out for a period longer than two months, for example, it does depend on the particular horse though, just like with the nutrition it is very individualized as far as how much each horse needs, especially once they are fit. So that is something that we will, we will come back to in a little bit. The 
consistency is very important. So you can be a weekend warrior and come out and play polo on the weekends, but your horses cannot. Your horses really need to be on a program because otherwise they're going to get muscle sore. They're going to sprain their ligaments. They're going to have all sorts of concussive issues with their bones um, if they're not on a regular exercise program. So I don't recommend that you be weekend warriors either, but if you have to be, that's okay. If your horse, but your horses cannot be. Make sure that they have a very consistent work program. So rest periods, crucial to longevity. Here's some horses sacked out. Mine, um, by the way. <laughs> it's a great picture. It probably was 30 degrees the night before, and then the sun came out. Right. But it is important really crucial to getting those 10 years out of a horse that you want to get minimum to have periods where they do not have to work. And that can range from any space of time from one month, twice a year to three or four months, twice a year, depending on what you're asking of your horses. In general, the more work they're being required, uh, the more work w which you're requiring of them, the longer rest periods I recommend. So if they're playing high goal polo, they should probably just play two seasons and have two seasons off. And it can go down from there, the less, you know, that is being required of them. But when they are able to truly get their shoes off for a couple of months and live out in pasture and um, rest and just be a horse, it really can cure a lot of physical issues as well as mental issues, which can be important for a polo pony. And even within the context of a season, I've known very successful polo players who completely give their horses off the day after a game. And I mean, their, their horses are turned out and they do not come into the barn and the horses do very well that way. There's also, um, some, of course, not everybody has access to turnout. So if your horses are stalled, that's not really an option. You can't let them just sit in the stall for 24 hours, but going out and just taking a easy half hour walk twice that day, rather than asking them to trot it all, it can be perfectly restful for the horses sometimes as well. The, um, other issue with these rest periods is it's going to be individualized to the horse. You're going to hear me say this over and over again. But some horses you'll find need longer periods of rest than others. And especially within the context of a season when they're actually in work, some horses, you know, those horses, they, they get fat if they have a day off and then they get heavy and then you can't play them the day, next day. Other horses, you can give them two days off of, you know, either turning out or just walking and they play even better that next chucker. So that's something again that, is has to be balanced with each horse and balanced with their feed intake. If your horses are on rest, you may not need to feed them quite as much grain in particular. Um, so it's something that the, the, you know, because when you talk about how the horse is going to be on the field and how much energy they're going to have, it's a balance between how much energy they're taking in from their feed and their nutritional um, support versus how much energy they're expending being an athlete. So that's always something that you have to sort of think of those two things working in tandem. Oh, let's see. I wanted to say a few more things about, oh, now I put it back twice about conditioning, um, which, uh, there were some questions about was one is about post injury. So, this is going to vary widely depending on what injury in particular you have with your horse. Um, and your veterinarian is going to be best equipped to give you particular advice about your horse based on, for example, if your horse has a tendon injury, what is going to be the schedule to recondition that horse? You're going to have to do that most likely based on ultrasound and, and repeated exams. But in general, think about, a horse that has been injured as needing a longer time in particular, longer walking time to come back to full work than his or her peers, which are, have been, have been, uh, resting for the same amount of time. So for example, let's say you have four horses, two of them didn't have any injury at all. 
and you turned them and, and one of them had an ankle injury and one of them had a tendon injury in the last season. Now it's November. You want to start playing again in a couple of months and you're thinking, oh, what should I do with my horses? Well, really what you have to ask yourself is what am I going to do with this horse and what am I going to do with this horse and what am I going to do with the third horse and what am I going to do with the fourth horse because every horse might be a little different you would start the one the one that had the tendon a year ago and is starting in work after a long recuperation period might need several weeks longer than the other horses so they should be started first and should have a period of walking and then you add in maybe the horse that had the ankle and allow them to walk a little bit longer too so they get a little bit looser and maybe try to stave off any arthritis that's developing there and then your healthy horses can maybe add in later, but maybe one of your healthy horses is really fat and one of your horse really healthy horses is thin, then, you know, you might kind of parlay that into the equation too. So it's going to be always a question of figuring out what's the best thing for each horse. The, the other issue is once they are playing and once they are fit, they're going to need different amounts of work. And that's, again, comes up with the issue of like, well, we only have one groom and this and that and the other. It might be worth your while to put a little bit of extra effort in it to try to tailor each horse's exercise program. And I know that's difficult to do in polo, but it is very important. And maybe sometimes it's the kind of thing that you can, if you want to ride anyways and you have a groom, you can incorporate your riding into helping your horses. So you can say, oh, well, this horse needs a little more work. So this is one that I'll ride an extra time that day. And my groom can just take the other horses out in a nice set. Or converse, this other horse needs to walk a lot more. And I'll just go for a walk on it and give it another extra half hour of walking or an extra hour of walking that day to try to build a little more muscle mass or, you know, get it a little bit calmer or for whatever reason you might be doing that. So try to think about... Um, individualizing your conditioning program. One of the things um, that I took away from your Team USPA talk was walking. Mm. And, that, and walking is kind of a foundational um, activity for conditioning the horse. And I don't think most of us really think of walking. We are thinking about going 90 miles an hour with our hair on fire. So could you maybe yeah. just talk about that just a little bit more? I mean, it's been sprinkled in there, but just... Yes. Uh... Walking is, uh, if there's a pyramid of conditioning, walking is at the bottom. So I think that walking is the best because one, it does not break down the muscle. It doesn't break down any ligaments. You have always have at least two feet on the ground when the horse is walking. You're not getting a lot of weight on each individual limb. There's no, there's very low concussive forces. Um, there's going to be no muscle breakdown. And in fact, it's been shown to be the best muscle builder of, of any gait. Um, so horses in programs that I recommend walk up to an hour, an hour and 15 minutes for a good long time before they start trotting. And after they are fit, in other words, after your horse has already played a chucker or two and you're happy with the way they're going, you will find that there's probably a good number of your ponies that won't need to do hardly anything else but walking for the rest of the season besides playing practices and, and playing chuckers. And you will have a huge benefit to that as far as reducing overwork and overuse injuries if you can find that balance, um, especially once your horses are fit. So many um, problems in polo ponies do come from overuse. And it's so preventable because we, we unlike other um, equine athletes, they don't need to go out and play every day. They play chuckers twice a week, maybe three times a week. Um, it's not like that jumper that needs to go jump every day or, or, you know, people want to jump every day. So they jump it every day. Um, so take, take advantage of that and say, Oh, well today the horses don't have to play so they can go walk for an hour and they will be so much stronger for it. Yeah. Great. Like that. Okay. There's a couple of questions as well. Um, I think I've addressed that one. So a lot of the questions do address like how to get a horse back from, from into a high goal program. 
Um, I sort of gave you an outline at the beginning where you would walk extensively for several weeks, um, add trotting, um, and then you start singling the horse and then you start playing slow chuckers. Uh, that's just a, a general guideline, but again, it's going to be different for every horse. And, oh, here's a good question. When to make accurate determination about playing your horses in hot weather from Luis Frentano. So thank you, Luis, for that question. And this, this is actually a conditioning issue because the horse has to be acclimatized, acclimatized, um, ideally to heat conditions before they're asked to perform in it. Um, there are also medical interventions, which you can ask your veterinarian to help you with for horses that are having to exercise and heat conditions. And then the third thing is we did talk about the fat in the diet helps horses um, metabolize uh, their feed in a cooler fashion to help them. But the most important thing is the first thing I mentioned, which is having those horses in the human environment and living there for a period of time before they're asked to actually go out and play a full chucker. So that, that's fairly important yeah. because they will start to sweat more and um, adapt to the heat stress. Yeah. Coming from Dallas, we played year round and it was 108. And if we didn't play when it was that hot, we'd never play. But then again, that's where they lived and they were used to it. Right. Where, so it's just. And the use of cooling systems after truckers is fabulous. I'm very been around long enough to know that they didn't used to have them. And I was very happy to see them being introduced in lots of places. So if you're, if you are in a hot environment and your club doesn't currently have any misters or, um, cold water hose or anything like that by the field, you could encourage them to incorporate that. It's very helpful for the horses. Okay. So last um, session, we'll try to um, wrap it up quickly because I know we need to get to the Q&A session but the, for, on veterinary care. So obviously, I can just give you an overview of this. Any specific questions, you're going to have to deal with your own veterinarian. But we'll try to give you a little bit of an idea of some of the things I think about in terms of veterinary care. So for vaccination, um, very important to... Again, see, I'm saying it again, tailor it to the individual horse's travel and living conditions. You don't want to over-vaccinate. You don't want to under-vaccinate. So ideally, a horse that is just staying at your farm and playing very local polo, not really interacting with a whole bunch of other horses, you don't need to do a lot of vaccinations every year. There's going to be your core vaccinations, which your veterinarian can recommend, depending on your area. Um, but you're not going to need to do, you know, it, uh, influenza every two months or some of the other things that are required when your horse is traveling, for example, for FEI or whatever. So really make sure that you talk to your veterinarian about what your needs are and what your horse's um, travel plans are because, and, and, the, and the living conditions is important too. If your horse is living with just a group of horses, let's say you have six horses and you have your own place and those horses don't come into contact with a lot of other horses, you have a completely different need of vaccination than the horse that's living in a large boarding facility in contact with lots of different horses, horses coming and leaving all the time. That's where you really need to be careful of, of vaccination. Um, and there was an excellent question from somebody about um, Christina, Christina Misa, yeah. yeah, she said, um, what do I do if I am good about vaccinating my horse, but other people aren't? So this is where the horse's own immunity is really, really important. And I wanted to talk about this at some point, but getting your horse to a very, um, high level of health. So we're talking about for the equine athlete, trying to optimize their health and boost their immunity. And that is, um, going to make them perform better on, on the field, but it will also help in not get them sick. So we've been talking about all the reasons that we, all, all the things that we can do to do this, the nutrition and the conditioning is very important. Um, you want your horse to look like an athlete and there's no shortcut to, to this. It's hard work. You have to feed them really well and you have to exercise them very well and, and they will look the part. 
and you know when they're healthy, when their coat is glowing, when they're full of vim and vigor, and um, they're well muscled and they look like an athlete. Um, vaccinations are an important part of boosting immunity. Try to spread the vaccinations out. I'm not a big believer in doing like the seven in one in one day. Um, it's much better to spread them out over the course of the year. And I know that's hard for some people because they want their veterinarian just to come out once a year and just give all those shots. But it's much better for your horse if you can spread that out a little bit. So the, the horse's immune system will have a better chance to react to each individual vaccine if it's not given concurrently with six other ones. Um, I also recommend not vaccinating immediately before you ship, but vaccinating, for example, five or seven days before you ship often gives the, the, the horse's immune system a chance to get kind of geared up and to boost it for the travel event, which can often be stressful in a horse. And then there's often things that you can do um, um, with your veterinarian, um, supplements, herbal supplements, um, injectable um, medications, which can help stimulate the horse's immune system to um, prevent um, them from getting infected to answer Christina's question. So th those are some of my ideas in answering that question. Um, and so we'll move on. Deworming. There's lots of questions about deworming as well. It used to be 10 years ago that you would um, deworm horses, you know, every two months. You do a rotating schedule that going through the different classes of dewormers, which all sort of work in a different method of, of killing the parasites. However, we are dealing with a lot more um, problems of having the bugs become immune to some of our medications. And so most veterinarians are recommending fecal egg counts for horses and to go ahead and deworm on that schedule. So in other words, you only use dewormers and you use dewormers that are specific to the particular horse's parasite load. I know that sounds intimidating, but it is probably the best way to do it. It, it also can end up saving you quite a bit of money because you might test your horses and they don't need anything and then you don't have to deworm them. And back to the individualization of treatment, they've also done studies that show that horses can be living together in a group in the same paddock and have the same deworming history, and they'll have different parasite loads. So it, there is a very strong component of the horse's individual immunity. It's how much they are able to get rid of any kind of um, parasite load that they ingest. So again, the fecal egg count is really the gold standard on, on that. Um, there was a question from Carolyn Stimmel. Thank you very much for this question, Carolyn. Um, so the horse is, that is on a regular worming program, but they look rough and they seem poor and they have no bloom to their condition or coat. So again, like 10 years ago, I would have just said double dose panicure for five days. Um, now I would say, yeah, you might want to try that, especially if their worming history is sketchy or if they have been in an area that is overgrazed or they've been in an area, they've been, maybe they've been stabled somewhere where there's a high turnover of horses, um, or, or some kind of environmental, uh, living condition that makes you suspicious that maybe they could have picked up some parasites. However, if they have been um, turned out on a 20 acre pasture that has never been overgrazed, um, you might not think that parasites are the primary problem. You would definitely do a fecal test and you would want to know their, if it's a new horse to you, you'd want to know their history of uh, their veterinary history, like have they been on, um, did they come from the track? Have they been on steroids, for example? Or did they recently have an infection that they've been on antibiotics? Um, and so you'd want to take that into account. And the other thing that is very useful and that has be become, um, we've done a lot of research on recently, veterinarians have, is the use of probiotics, which I did mention earlier um, in the nutrition section. But Probiotics are incredibly important for digestive health. And when we're talking about a horse that has those symptoms, um, they look rough, they seem poor, and they have no bloom, 
often you're talking about digestive disturbances. And so often it's a long-term thing, but you will often see it within a few weeks if you add probiotics to their feed Mm -hmm. or you give them a course of probiotics. So I I highly recommend doing that as well as thinking about the parasite load Mm -hmm. for those horses. Okay. Preventative maintenance for equine athletes. Here we have pictures of ice boots. There's lots of different kinds available. Anytime you can get ice on your horse, do it. I don't care what kind of boot it is. Even just if it's a pair of jeans. Yeah, if it's a pair of jeans or a polo bandage, you know, whatever it is, get get the ice on. Very important. Very um, useful. Bandaging, we touched on this a little bit earlier. I am a believer in um, bandaging horses and wrapping them after they play. Um, maybe it just makes you feel good, but if that's all it does, that's okay. And uh, I've had people tell me before that if you put a poultice on, that's great. But really the best thing about putting a poultice on is that you have to hose it off the next day. (laughs) And so you're cold hosing and that that actually does probably more benefit than the poultice did originally. But there are some poultices that work as well. That work pretty well. Now, I have a question about um, bandaging, Shelly. I yes. think I saw it somewhere in, in here. I won't go back in. But the basic question was um, bandaging for work wraps versus, oh. uh, you know, versus boots. And, and are they really for support or are they to guard against? Oh, the- okay. I'm Let's- sorry. I, I missed that part of that question. So bandaging for work. I am a believer that when you're conditioning your horses, you ought not to bandage them because I think that they need to get strong, especially when they're only walking. And then if they're only five to 10 minutes trotting, maybe that when you start working up to a 20 minute trot, if you have an old horse that has bad tendons or something, maybe you put a wrap on it every now and then. But I I really believe that when the horse is getting conditioned, that that's what you're trying to do. You're trying to strengthen that, that tendon that was injured or, um, you know, those ankles, um, that were injured or whatever kind of problem you have. And if you just wrap all the time that you're going to create a dependence on the wrapping. Now, having said that, there's probably some, you know, pretty severe injuries that are going to need to be wrapped. Um, boots and like, so, so bell boots and then tendon boots, um, again, are going to be particular to the horse's gait and the level of polo they're getting that, that, that is being played. It also is particular to your farrier because uh, your farrier can get really pissed off if they're constantly pulling shoes off. So sometimes bell boots help prevent mm-hmm. them from pulling shoes off. Um, if they overreach at all, you're going to need to use bell boots. Um, the the polo wrap itself is incredibly effective at preventing wounds in the lower leg. It is more effective than any other material. Um, I've seen many wounds on the lower leg that get sliced right through the neoprene Australian wraps, which I love for other reasons, but they're they're not very protective. Um, and that, but that the the old fashioned polo wraps really do a good job of protecting against lower leg injuries, um, as far as skin wounds. And, and then the, the tendon boots, um, you know, you're just going to have to have your own opinion on that one. I'm not, I, I won't conjecture to <laughs> okay. give you advice. It's going to, there, there's a cost benefit to it. Okay. Um, it's, it is protective. It is cumbersome. Uh, there's, there's two ways to see that one. Okay. So let me just see if I can summarize what you just said there. So the, um, wraps are both protective and supportive but in conditioning, polo wraps, the, yes. polo wraps right. Yes. But in conditioning, your thought is that um, actually you're trying to strengthen the horse, and that that diminishes that. Or, or so, okay. Precisely. Um, and then um, bell boots. Okay. All right. Good. All right. I'm glad we went back to that. Okay. Okay. So. Last one, preventative preventive maintenance, checking for soundness. I really recommend that everybody gets to know how their horses trot. Uh, and there's no substitute for just going out there and doing it every day and watching your horse trot down the barn aisle. And each horse is going to travel a little differently. And as you develop your eye watching this, you're going to be able to pick up subtleties as you get more proficient. 
and you're going to know when your horse is a little bit sore. And that is, again, the key to longevity is to catching, is catching things early, not letting them become major issues, trying to catch them when they're minor issues. And you can call your vet and give the horse some medication and rest it for three days and it's fine as opposed to letting th something go and go and go, and then it's broken and you have to give three months off or something like that. So um, I just throw that in as another way to maintain your horse. Okay, so coming to your relationship with your veterinarian, I can't stress enough that you need to be an active participant or have a manager who's an active participant to know when something is recommended or being done, what are the costs and benefits um, of a medication. And particularly if you are using any kind of medication without the super direct supervision of a veterinarian, have a really good knowledge of what you're using and try to make sure that you're not going to be doing any damage to your horse. Um, unknowingly, um, and that it's consistent with what your goals are. So your goals, you know, you, they may change, uh, at the beginning of the season, you may be thinking long-term, like, I just really want to keep my horses going through the whole season. I wouldn't do anything to compromise their health. And then when it gets to the very last weekend and the last game, and it's the finals, maybe if your veterinarian said, oh, well, we can get through this one more game if we give this, but you know, we wouldn't have done it three months ago. Well, maybe you would say, okay, well, I'll do it, but maybe you wouldn't. But these are the types of things that you need to have an open, open communication with about, about with your veterinarian. Um, and just be clear about what your goals are for the, for the short term and for the long term. Okay, a first aid kit. Um, briefly, um, having things to cover wound care is really important. I always recommend to my clients that they go to the grocery store and buy four zip, uh, like sort of like Tupperware sandwich sized boxes and they can get a sleeve of gauze sponges from either their vet or usually from the salary store and have one with dry sponges in it, one with alcohol soaked sponges in it, one with betadine, one with chlorhexidine, which are just basic, um, wound care, uh, swabs so that you can have those in your first aid kit that's in your trailer or in your barn and it'll save you a lot of a lot of trouble for um you, you should also have bandage materials available so you should have some so those those four by four gauze sponges are good just to put over a wound if you need to then bandage it until the veterinarian comes um and you know have things like uh the cotton wraps and uh, probably vet wrap or some standing bandages around um, things that you can bandage a horse with if they do have a wound. You can also keep uh, disposable razors because uh, it's great to be able to sort of get the hair away from a wound so that uh, the hair doesn't contaminate the wound. The next thing is you would want to have with you would perhaps be, um, an ice maker in the barn, as I recommended earlier, great preventative care for inflammation. You might have, uh, well, you have the alcohol wipes. You might want a bottle of alcohol, just regular rubbing alcohol to, um, use as a liniment, for example, on the legs before you wrap them. Um, you might want to have a bottle of DMSO with gloves that you could also use as an anti-inflammatory on areas. Um, furacin or some other kind of, uh, topical anti antiseptic cream would be good. And, um, Epsom salts. We, we mentioned that earlier as a use for soaking feet for abscesses. There were a couple questions I wanted to address about veterinary care before we go on to the general Q and a session. And they were questions from Robin. Thank you, Robin, about tying up and about anhydrosis. So just very briefly, but both are, are fairly common in polo ponies. Tying up is in the thoroughbred, which is usually 
there's different kinds of, of tying up according to different breeds of horses, but usually in polo ponies, it's re recurrent exertional rhabdomyolysis, which abbreviated R E R. And it can be prevented not so easily, but can be attempted to be prevented by keeping horses from getting excited from good conditioning practices and good nutritional practices. So a lot of the things that we talked about with conditioning and nutrition are very important for the tie up. The horse that is prone to tying up, having regular work and having regular feed with a high percentage of forage as being the primary um, source of calories. Um, so horses that are pastured or horses that um, are eating very good quality hay, you might want to not give them very much grain. Um, you might want to give them a lot of turnout to have uh, to for the calming effect of that. You want to have them in regular work. It it definitely exacerbated by a rainy day and they don't get out, and then the next day you get tie ups. Um, and then the the calm aspect as well. And and this is something that's very tricky. You have to learn with your own particular horse what their triggers are to get in tying up. And it often is something like, um, you know, they don't like going out late to go be singled. And if you single them at six o'clock, they're going to tie up because that was supposed to be feeding time, for example, or they have to, they go out, um, getting, they go out and be, you know, are singled, um, alone. Maybe they don't like being out on the riding field alone. They might, you might learn that if they go out with a buddy, they won't tie up. There's things like this that you have, and it's, it's, there is definitely, um, you know, for lack of a better word, psychological component to tying up in horses. It's definitely seen more in mares and it's definitely seen in flighty mares. So try to learn about your horse and figure out what those triggers are. Um, and hydrosis is when a horse stops sweating. This can be a life-threatening situation. Well, so can um, tying up, actually. If a horse has a... Oh, let's, let's go with a little bit of, of care of tying up. If a horse does tie up, do not move the horse. Um, any kind of movement will just make it much, much worse. Keep the horse warm. Keep it calm. And it needs anti-inflammatories. If it is just a very minor tie-up, like there's just one muscle that's um, involved, you may not need to call your veterinarian, but in many cases you do need to call your veterinarian and that horse might need fluids and medication to help it through. Cause it's a very, very painful process and horses can look like they're colicking when they're tied up. But the, the main thing that you will notice is that they do not want to move and you should not make them move. Unlike of course in colic, everybody thinks, Oh, walk them, walk them, walk them. So very different treatment for those two problems. So make sure that you, um, do not move a horse that's tied up. Um, okay, so now we will go to anhydrosis. The uh, problem is usually created by horses by horses exercising in very hot, humid conditions, and it just sort of maxes out their system, and their system decides to quit, which can obviously be very dangerous for the horse. The treatments are varied. Again, sort of like the, the RER that we were just talking about, there's no one solution. There are many different ideas about how to treat it. You can treat it with um, various medications. You can treat it with various supplements, um, dark beer, acupuncture. There's lots of things out on the table, which basically tells you that none of them work 100% of the time. Um, but in per some particular horses, some are going to work and some are not. You're just going to have to try um, there's lots of supplements out there. There's vitamin E selenium, there's one AC, there's, uh, um, ventipulmin. There's definitely different medications that people use. And I would advise, uh, conferring with your veterinarian and maybe you can go through a, uh, program or a protocol where you can try different things out and see which one works for your horse. So that's sums up what I have prepared and we're going to open the lines for questions. Awesome. Kim, you're first. Yeah. <laughs> um, so it looks like we, we're at about uh, 8.19 East Coast time. So 
So that 8.30 just became 8.30-ish, but it's okay. So, because I know a lot of you are um, going to want to hang around for the questions, and, and if not, that's okay too. Um, I did want to let everybody know, I forgot to mention this earlier on, that uh, Dr. Jim uh, Brendamule is um, going giving us, he's uh, sort of sponsoring this webinar or underwriting or I don't know what, but he's given us 10 bottles of Wound Wonder um, to give away to attendees of this um, webinar. So we will be going through the attendees and randomly choosing 10 of you and contacting you to get um, your Wound Wonder, which um, we use, <laughs> Sam uses it, I said like Windex in um, my big fat Greek wedding. So um, anyway, good stuff from him and we really appreciate him doing that. So let's get on to your questions. Uh, I'm gonna just sort of start up here at the top and off we go, wait, let's, before I do that, there we go, um, all right. Hang on here. I got to get all the way back to the top of these questions here. Uh, okay, let's start here. Uh, all right. Um, one of our horses trips a lot while playing. I don't think it's a hoof issue as they are looked after carefully. Any other ideas? A lot of these specific questions I'm going to have a hard time answering um, without looking at your horse, I would say that most tripping issues do have to do with shoeing. However, there can be, um, nerve issues. Um, there can be coordination issues. There can be hind end pain, which causes the horse to not put enough weight on the hind end and therefore is putting excessive stress on the front legs and, and ends up on or in the front half of the body and then ends up tripping. There can be neurological issues as well. So I'm sorry to say that there's a whole host of things that could be the problem and I wouldn't really be able to tell you which one of those would be the most likely. Yeah, but that's a good list to start talking to your vet about, right? Yes. And and definitely your vet should watch the horse travel and examine the back and the back end because that, that often is, is a problem. Okay, good. Um, Jim wants to know during the winter, I feed a mix of hay that's heavy with alfalfa. Is that a problem gastro wise? No, it is. Uh, I, I, I love a feed that is a mix with alfalfa for polo ponies. I think it gives them a, plenty of energy. And if they're eating a grass hay, it, it's a good balance uh, along with the alfalfa, which is, I assume what you're, you're doing, then they're getting a balance of, of the two with the alfalfa being higher in protein, higher in calcium, and then the, the grass hay providing more of a fiber content. Okay. Uh, so Tim says, we're just bopping through these. Yeah, we'll Tim's, get them. Tim says, what are the best sources of fat? Okay. The best sources of fat are, um, rice bran, rice bran oil, corn oil, and, um, flaxseed oil, things, things like that. Okay. But a lot of feeds will have the fat in them now because it, it has been, um, proven to be so helpful. So you can really look at the feed tag on whatever grain you're purchasing and shoot for like 20% fat is, is really good. Mm -hmm. Okay. Again, there's a great video from uh, yeah. Charlie Herrick on, and it's all about reading the label. Yeah. Right? It's all about and, reading the label. And, uh, and he explains that and how to read it. It's really good. Go there and, and, and look at that. Um, okay. Uh, Linda says, I haven't seen polo grooms clean the hooves like we did with a uh, hundred jumpers and dressage horses. Does that mm. need to be done? Yes. <laughs> okay, well, that's an easy answer. <laughs> um, okay, uh, Paula says, thank you for addressing the feed hoof relationship. If you feed a lot of starchy food and you keep your horse in a stall and don't, uh oh, Paula, oh, got sorry, cut off, Paula. your, your uh, question got cut off, so we can't see the end of your comment. So we're gonna we're gonna keep going. Um, Lori says, how do you teach a non-polo farrier to shoe for polo? I would recommend that uh, you don't try to teach your fair anything, <laughs> first of all, because that might be rife with issues. Um, but he would need to 
learn how to do it by watching polo ponies move, watching polo games, and ideally apprenticing with somebody who is a good polo farrier for a period of time. Okay. I think I just found the end of Paula's question. Right? Oh, yeah. Here we go. So, um, so she, so mm -hmm. she says, if you feed a lot of starchy food and keep your horse in a stall and don't, don't. exercise the horse, will your horse your get hoof related problems? Starchy food and don't exercise. Will your horse get? Yeah. Hoof well, don't, yeah. Don't feed starchy food and leave your horse in a stall and not exercise it. I would definitely agree with that. Okay. Recipe for obesity and laminitis and, and founder. And, okay. <laughs> yeah. All right. Okay. Um, comment. Newest research suggests that abscess be soaked in cold water, not warm water. You know anything about that? Heard anything about that? Opinion about that? It can be that way. I would recommend definitely dissolving the Epsom salt, so which works a little bit better in, in warm water. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, bode, this is from Jay. Bode tendon is a common issue in polo horses. How can the farrier influence this injury in a positive way? Okay, well, the, the main issue with farriery with um, boat tendons is trying to decrease the breakover point. So you're talking about hoof balance here, which is really hard to just talk about without having a picture or, or some, some sort of at least two-dimensional um, drawing. But if you're looking at the side of a horse from, from the side and you're looking at the front foot, let's say, and you watch where that foot is contacting the ground. There's a front point at the toe and then there's the back point at the heel. And if you draw a line along the floor from that, from the front to the back, halfway in between there is where the, the pivot point is. And when you have a, a, a lot of thoroughbreds, what they end up doing is that that heel gets underrun. So it's moving towards the toe and then the toe gets long and it's moving long too. And so then the halfway point is pushed way forward. And what you want to do as a farrier to try to decrease the incidence of bow tendon is bring that halfway point farther back underneath the horse by shortening the toe and getting the heel to not be underrun. That answers your question. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know whether you all can visualize what I'm saying or not, but uh, that, that was the best I could do. But that that's a, a common goal for um, not only bow tendons, but for thoroughbreds who are not racing on the track in general. Okay. Hmm. Um, Ahmed says, do you recommend joint supplement mm. in general and specifically or especially for senior horses? And do you have any recommendation in regards to doses? I do like joint supplements. As far as doses, you would just follow the, the manufacturer recommendations. And especially for senior horses is, is very useful. And it really comes down to a question of cost. If, if you can afford it, it's a good idea. So when, when we're talking joint supplements, that could mean a lot of different things. It could mean feed. It could mean yeah. legend or polyglycan. I mean, what? I mean, right? right. You're, you're basically looking at either oral or injectable. And there, there's also, um, well, let's just stick, stick with those. And the, the research um, has been very consistent that shows that Several of these products do work. I'm not going to be promoting any particular products tonight, but uh, there are several that you can talk to your veterinarian that have been proven in good studies to work and decrease joint inflammation. So I, in my own practice, I generally tend to stick to those rather than use generics. Um, but a lot of people use generics and think that they're very useful too. So I, that's another thing I just talked to your veterinarian about. Whatever you do decide to use, I, I would recommend that you have some sort of um, proof either in the form of your veterinarian recommending it or a study that's shown that it's worked before you waste your money on it because there's a million out there and they're not, they don't all do what they say they're going to do. So, but let me just clarify this. There are some oral and some Inject injectable, injectable that work. Yes. It's just a question of which ones in both categories. That's correct. All right. 
Anne says, I have mm. one horse of 10, a Palomino, that always gets abscesses. What can I do to prevent this? Yeah. Um, it's, it's probably something genetic with the, the hoof um, on a horse that continues to, to get abscesses, especially a, a Palomino. Maybe it has light colored hooves, which a lot of people think are more prone to it. Um, there are, are some good products that you can use. Your farrier can recommend to harden the sole and, and make them, um, more durable. Um, I'm, I'm a big believer in, in bare, being barefoot as well with proper trimming to, to harden the foot up. And that can sometimes help. Um, and then watch the footing, like we talked about earlier, where, um, you know, certainly with a horse that's prone to abscesses, you don't want to ever take them on gravel or on rocks or anything like that. Okay. I think we um, addressed this, but I'm just going to come back to it real quickly. Uh, Leslie says, how much complete time off, if any, do horses need between seasons, such as after the indoor season and before the outdoor season or after summer season? And should they be at complete rest or still being exercised? Really good question. It depends on the horse. Um, ideally, if, like I, I said, I think earlier that a horse that's working really hard, um, for example, in high goal polo should have two to three months off between seasons. Um, but, uh, it depends on their injuries. Also, they, they might have injuries that require more time off. Um, and as far as the second part of that question, let me go back that minute. Oh yeah. Should they be at complete rest or still being exercised? It really depends on the situation that they're in. If they're in a beautiful, big pasture, which, you know, big, I mean, as like a stocking rate, that's two acres per one horse. So you're turning your string out in a nice 20 acre pasture and they have plenty of grass and they're really happy and they have to walk a lot to get between food and water. They're going to get enough exercise that they're going to stay at a low level of fitness, which is very important. If they are in a stall, they're going to need to be exercised. Or if they're in a small paddock where they don't really walk very much, they're going to need to be exercised. But when I say exercise, I would say like, you know, three or four times a week, go out for a walk on it for an hour or something like that, where it's just walking. It's just, um, not every day, but they're maintaining some low level of fitness, which is what you want during the time off. Okay, question from Tyler. He says, what are your thoughts on horses being stall wrapped and left in a stall overnight after a game? Yeah, well, we discussed this a little bit. I've seen people do it many different ways successfully. Being turned out is is a great way to recuperate a horse after a game. If they're standing in a stall, it's even more important that they're wrapped, though. Okay. Because unfortunately, a lot of clubs don't oh. have... They don't, right. yeah, stall only, right? Right. That's all, the important uh, thing is not to just put your horse in the stall and let him sit there. He's going to get muscle sore. So. So cooling them down properly after a game. Um, if you're playing at 11 o'clock and they get put back in the stall, I would almost recommend that they get taken out and hand grazed or something that evening. Um, just let them move around a little bit. Yeah. Uh, Amanda says, how do you feel about poulticing after every game? I understand horses who have had old injuries, but I feel like it might hide a new injury the next day. That's very true. We often say in our barn that, uh, you're not really out of the woods until the second morning after the game, because the first morning, if things are poulticed, it might not show up. However, I still think that you're doing more benefit than harm by decreasing that inflammation, even if it is a new injury. Um, but yes, you should be aware of that. Um, but again, the, the benefit of poultice is that you get to hose it off the next day and get that cold water going over the horse. The other, the other benefit sometimes is that you actually have to look at the leg when you bandage it. And I had a veterinarian mentor who told me one time, oh, I'd always tell people to wrap the legs because then they just have to get down on their knees and they have to look at the leg. <laughs> and it's as simple as that. Mm -hmm. And they notice things. Yeah. Um, Lori says, can you speak to electrolytes as part of nutrition in the season? Okay. Yes. Electrolytes are important, especially in a horse that's exercising in hot and humid conditions when they're losing a lot of electrolytes through sweating. So that is the primary, um, reason to supplement with electrolytes. 
Okay, now I have my own question. Mm -hmm. I got to get one in myself, right? And okay. Sam, this one's for you. Um, electrolytes, even during the winter, to make them drink more? Yes or no? I'm not a, a huge fan of that, um, but I, I just prefer to give them free choice salt. Free choice salt. Yes, which we talked we talked about in that mm -hmm. first slide, I think. So instead of putting electrolytes in their grain, which is sort of force feeding them, so to speak, you can give it free access. Mm -hmm. And if they need it, they'll they need it. They'll they'll, they'll eat get. it. And um, there's lots of different. There's also um, really good electrolyte and vitamin mineral supplements that you can put out in um, uh, like round buckets to give horses free choice to it too. And you'll find if you do that, it'll be interesting because you'll notice that some horses will eat it and some horses won't. Right. And then they're, and, and they do tend to know. Isn't that interesting? Okay. Um, uh, oh, oh, lime. <laughs> Any thoughts yeah. on lime? We are in an endemic area and not clear how reliable testing is and when to treat. Are we blaming too many things on lime? A uh, very good question. Lyme is a huge problem. The testing has gotten a lot better. Um, you know, it's, it's much, much better now than it was five or 10 years ago. So I would, I would tend to believe the testing more now than, than in the past. And the results of treatment are usually quite dramatic. And so you can, um, continue the treatments based on what your veterinarian recommend recommends. But I, um, Let's see that question again. Sorry. Um, you know, that's going to be something that your veterinarian is really going to have to work with you on as far as um, diagnosing and treating that. But I, I do think that we are not blaming too many things on Lyme. Even though I'm not in an endemic area, um, I, I do keep up to date with it. And it seems like it has become a huge problem for lots of areas. Hmm. Uh, any thoughts on stretching? <laughs> yeah, I was just seeing if these were the same questions. Oh, so, yeah. um, Tyler, stretching in horses and humans shouldn't occur before work. It should really only occur after the muscles are warm. And so, um, and stretching is great if you really are comfortable with, um, your horse's anatomy and your horse's disposition. Um, it should, you should only do things that feel very good to your horse and never force anything because there is a, a possibility of harming your horse with forced stretching. Hmm. But if you feel comfortable and you're, you're, um, and you really like doing it, I'd say that's great to do after work. After work. Okay. Uh, another question from Tyler. What are your thoughts using lavender extract placed on a horse's chest or nose to help calm them before or during a game? If it works for your horse, do it. Okay. Good answer. Uh, any recommendations oh. for senior horse feeding? Well, in general, horses, as they get older, um, have more digestive issues. So using probiotics is really important. And then keeping care of their teeth. We didn't really talk about teeth at all tonight, but um, having your uh, veterinarian uh, float your horse's teeth regularly to keep on, on top of that issue will be important, um, even more so as your horse ages. And then finding a good um, senior feed um, which is available through most feed stores. But remember that if the horse is not able to eat forage, um, then you really need to adapt to that by providing beet pulp or other um, feeds that are high in fiber. Okay, we've got about four or five more questions, and then we're done. But um, I want to catch, catch these over here. Um, Rebecca, speaking of teeth, wanted to know how often is floating really needed? Is file floating or the newer electrical Dremel file floating better? I don't know if I want to get into the file versus electrical, um, debate. Um, I think it depends on the person who's using them. 
um, it's in the hands of the practitioner how good the job is. I think people can do a good job with either method. And how often it's needed um, really depends um, on the horse. Again, individual horses are very different. Um, you'll find because they have different tooth wear patterns, they, um, you know, chew differently, and, and there's lots, lots of variation. But a general rule of thumb would be at least once a year. And that's, I just picked that out because most people remember to do things once a year. Um, but some people will try to do that more often. Okay. Um, thought this was a great question too, from Jennifer at what age of the polo horse should you go from say three to four club practices or games to maybe two practices or game regarding the best quality of life for the horses? What are some signs that a horse is coming up on being done playing polo? A really excellent question. And I love that somebody's interested in the horse welfare aspect of it. Um, it depends on the horse. Um, some horses can play high goal polo until they're 18 and then, you know, they don't want to do it anymore. If you know your horse well, you'll know when they start, um, one being sour. Um, the first thing you'll often notice is they won't want to go into throw-ins. And then the second thing is that, um, you know, watching for the signs of optimal health, like we were talking about earlier, like watching their body condition score, watching their coat, um, how much energy they have. Um, and if you notice a, a sudden drop in any of those factors, then that might be your sign that you need to slow down a little bit with your horse. But a lot of polo ponies, you know, they, they like to work and they like the game and they do better if they're in a, a an amount of amount of work and they get to continue doing their job. So, um, it's something that you'd play by ear, but I, I would say in general, 18 would be the the time when I would start thinking about toning it down for, for a healthy horse. Hmm. Okay. Um, I missed one also from Robert. Robert wants to know your opinion of feeding fescue compared to coastal. Hay or grass? Oh, he's not here. Sorry. I yeah, can't ask no, that he's, question. He's here. Actually, he's, it was up higher, but um, I believe he's talking hay. Yeah. Although I think he feeds both. So, <laughs> yeah, I think that there's lots of different grass hay options out there. Coastal is, um, can be problematic for horses, for, for some horses, uh, and increased chances of having certain types of digestive disturbances. So if you have a horse like that, then you're not going to have that option. Um, and, um, best you can be, um, well, fescue grass can be a problem sometimes for, for pregnant mares. Um, but in, in general, whatever is available to you locally is probably a good answer for your horses because the local um, environment is going to uh, benefit your horses. And so if you're feeding something like coastal, I do recommend that you feed some other kind of hay with it. Um, for example, alfalfa is a good mix with coastal because it'll keep the digestive tract moving a little bit better. And, um, and the, the other, it, the other thing is to not give it free choice for most horses because some horses will gorge themselves on it and, uh, be more likely to develop, uh, digestive disturbances. Mm-hmm. So what if you've got a horse that you can't give alfalfa because it's like crack cocaine? <laughs> to, yeah. What would you mix with I it? I would just stick with a little bit higher quality hay, like a Timothy or something like that, yeah. if I couldn't feed alfalfa. Okay. All right. Two more questions. Oh, oh, I thought we had a few left. A few more. Uh, when turning out to rest for 30 days, is it okay not having stalls or loafing sheds available for shade and weather so long as there are trees on the property? Sure. I mean, turn, turnout is good and trees are good. And, uh, as long as your horse is being looked after on a daily basis and checked, then I wouldn't worry about it too much. Not having a shed. Okay. Um, Linda says, is there any good massage equipment and expensive I can use to massage the horse? Any recommendation? 
there, there are, um, not inexpensive equipment. <laughs> Probably the most inexpensive thing you can do is, uh, do it yourself, which there are some good schools you can learn to do. You can probably do some online things and good grooming and good rubbing is it goes a long way. Um, so and I'm, I'm not really in the position to be recommending any products tonight. So, um, but, uh, but definitely there aren't any things that are, that I know of that are inexpensive. Sorry to say. Okay. Um, does cribbing have anything to do with ulcers or is this purely behavioral? Any ideas mm. to stop a cribber? Yes. There was some very interesting research done recently that ulcers could be involved in cribbing behavior. And I have treated a few cribbers with anti-ulcer medication, which has helped reduce the cribbing. So I would definitely recommend trying that on your horses um, that crib. Um, the, the theory is that when horses crib, they're releasing sodium bicarbonate from their saliva into the stomach and therefore um, treating the acid buildup in in the stomach. And so in a way, they're cribbing to self-medicate. That That's the theory. It, it hasn't been proven. But anecdotally, there's a lot of veterinarians who see um, an improvement in cribbing behavior with proper anti-ulcer medication. So it is something worth trying. And, and, and cribbing in general, um, turnout, um, can really help. And, um, again, digestive health really helps too. So proper nutritioning, nutrition program. Okay. Uh, and says, how do you feel about walkers, walking machines mm. to prep local polo ponies? And I think, uh, Tyler had the same question. I love walking machines. Um, if they're safe and your horses, um, you know, uh, accustomed to them because honestly it, it's really hard for people to walk horses as much as they need to be walked. And so if you can add another half an hour a day through a walking machine, I'm all for it. I think it's great. Okay. Um, and then Tyler says, what's your estimated retirement age for a lower goal arena polo pony? Really hard to say. It just depends on the horse. Most horses are going to be retired, um, because of injury. And, um, and if they are sound, um, you know, and, and they're in good body condition, um, and they're eating well, they can certainly go into their twenties. I don't know if this helps or matters, but I, I know that, um, Tyler is the president of a, um, college. Oh, okay. Team. Uh, and so the horses that they're getting are probably more dinged up than maybe. Yeah. Uh, right. Or yes. But however, um, low goal arena is, is not as physically demanding on a horse. And so they often can continue going on for quite a long time if they're right. well taken care of and um, you use a lot of good preventative maintenance on them. Okay. Uh, okay. Same question about the walker. Yeah. Um, can you use blood exams to check how fit your horse is? Um, yes, you can. I mean, as far as, um, checking muscle enzymes was something that, um, was very much in vogue a few years ago, um, based on the human research that shows that you should tailor your work out every single day to what your muscles are actually doing. So if you want to do that kind of intensive work, I highly recommend it. It's, it's quite intensive, but it's a good idea. You can also obviously use blood exams to, um, test your general, the horse's general immunity, um, and, uh, you know, optimize the, the health. So, um, if that's something that's accessible to you, um, go for it. Is it possible to feed too much fiber? No, a horse won't eat too much fiber. Um, I mean, they're, they're, they're made to eat fiber all day long or, you know, 16 hours a day to graze. So, um, well, I, I, you know, they'll, they might get obese, but, uh, it's not bad for them okay. in the sense that they're, it's going to cause them, uh, health problems besides obesity. All right. And last question. Does weaving lead to ulcers and any suggestions on reducing weaving behavior? Okay. Well, we, we talked about the weaving and the cribbing earlier as far as um, that's, those are definitely related to being stable vices. Um, often happen 
with horses that are young and put in uh, a pretty unnatural environment as far as being in a stall 24 seven. And so once those behaviors are established, they become habitual, of course, and it's hard to change them. Um, but you can definitely see improvement in them. And, and the best way to do that is by socializing the horses and by giving them access to a more natural life as far as lots of turnout. So those would be my recommendations. And as far as leading to ulcers, um, it's not necessarily causal, but it's definitely correlated. Some of the same problems that cause weaving also cause ulcers. So um, stress, um, uh, being in an unnatural environment, um, having unnatural food um, sources, in other words, like eating a high grain diet and low forage, all those things are going to um, lead to perhaps both of those behaviors, I mean, the behavior and the medical problem of ulcers. Okay, one last question. Okay, I'm going to sneak oh. in, Anne, and then we're absolutely done. An add-on question. Would you ever use only a walker to prep for the season? No sets, no trotting, maybe singles later on. No, they need to trot to develop their cardiovascular strength. Um, so the answer to that would be no. But you could use it certainly for at the beginning of the season when they're just walking. And then you could use it once the horses are fit on days between games, if you're just going to walk, certainly a subset of your, of your um, group of horses might only need to walk between games. Um, there's usually a couple in everybody's string who don't need a whole lot of work in between games. And then there's others that need a lot of work. So those horses you could, uh, you know, put in walkers and, and just take to the field. All right, we're going to cut it off there. We've gone way beyond 8.30-ish. Uh, um, but these have been really great questions that you all um, are asking, and, and I really appreciate Shelly staying around to, to answer them. I hope you've gotten a lot out of them. Uh, as many of you know, this is a, a monthly thing that we do in association with the United States Polo Association, co-produced by Polo Skills Network. For those of you who have not been to Polo Skills I will say again, we have a tremendous amount of information there, so I hope you will go take advantage of that. Um, we're going to call it a night. We are going to, I will give away the 10 bottles of Wound Wonder. I will contact you and probably post it on Facebook as well um, for the winners. And on your way out, if you would be so kind as to let us know how you liked the webinar, what you liked, what you didn't like, what you'd like to see more of, who you would like to hear from. And I will do my level best to get those folks in to talk to you about uh, those topics. If you found it helpful, please let the USPA know. Our funding is coming up in a month or two, and they need to hear from you in order to continue this program. So that's it, everybody. Have a great evening. Thank you so much, Shelly. I've really enjoyed this, and every time I talk to you, I learn so much. Thank you, everybody, for um, being interested in improving the welfare of your horses. Good night. Good night, everybody. <laughs>